Yeah, it's lovely, lovely to be here. It's been been a while and it was a, a very a loving feeling knowing that I was going to be joining all of you in the San Francisco Dharma Collective tonight. My apologies that I wasn't able to be there in person. I've been sick for the last few days and so at the last instant we changed it from a hybrid event to an online event. So thank you for being able to roll with the flow with this one. Um, I'm excited to get to know you all a little bit more and practicing. And what I thought to do just to start with is just to have you chat where you are calling in from in case that uh, it's not all just San Francisco. It's just nice to know. So put it in the chat box where you're, where you're calling in from. And I will read them. San Francisco, New Haven, Berkeley, San Francisco, San Diego, San Francisco, Oregon, San Francisco, Germany. Awesome. Awesome. So the next uh, request is just to know what you are arriving with. Like what's the, the gist of your feeling sense, the feeling tone that you're coming to this with? In Saskatchewan, Portola District, Curiosity, thank you. Interesting in helping the world, thank you. Openness, thank you. What else? More compassionate practice, thank you. A little tired, a little sad, a little happy, thank you. Nervous, excited, happy to be learning. Body a bit funny, recovering from a fast. A little apprehensive about tomorrow. Just waking up from a nap, trying to wake up. Awesome, thank you. Anything else? Well, it's just nice to get a little bit of a read of where you all are at. Just helps me land and helps me have a sense of where you are. Um, my request uh, for people if to keep your devices on a stable surface and if you are eating, like eating, eating, not just nibbling, nibbling, to turn your video off because my it does something, it scrambles my brain, both of those things. Drinking is not an issue, but that would be helpful. Um, today is International Mental Health Day as it so happens. And the recent war in Israel may be stirring up a whole host of feelings, overwhelm, anxiety, fear, anger, hopelessness, depression, frustration, feeling nauseous, feeling righteous, feeling scared. And of course, the impact of this is not in isolation, but it is in conjunction with all the other things that are going on in the world right now. And so all of this really is hard to metabolize. It's hard to digest the, the shock, the fear, the trauma, and to find a, a way to add to the solution rather than contribute to the problem. So it turns out that my understanding of what this topic is about, a trauma-informed approach to the Satipatthana, my hope is, is that it's going to help with what we're all dealing with right now. And what I want to do is start with a guided meditation to help us ground, let our system set, you know, find a little bit measure of ease and safety, and then after maybe 20, 25 minutes of guided meditation, then I'll begin with more of the talk. Okay. So what I, let me just get my timer to go because I can get really disoriented with time. So let me get my timer up. Turn this off. Turn that off. 
on. Okay. So what I'd like to invite you to do to begin with is in your room right where you are, to just look around. And notice what you notice. And make sure that you look over your shoulders. And I'd like you to pay particular attention to the safety that's around you. Familiar objects, familiar smells, familiar things, and that in that what is familiar, there is an absence of danger. There isn't anything in the visual field that's scary. And as you notice that, just notice what happens to your nervous system. And now I'd like to invite us all, except for me, to, to hum. Hum as loudly as you like. And the invitation is to put your hands on your heart and another on your belly. And just allow yourself to hum and to feel the vibration moving through you. So now with your hand on your heart and your hand on your belly, you can stop humming. And just allow your body to rock a little bit back and forth over your sitting bones. Feeling the warmth of your hand on your heart and the warmth of your hand on your belly. Rocking yourself in a very nourishing, gentle, loving way. Feel the soothing nature of rocking. Nothing that you need to worry about or do. Just feel the nourishment and the soothing, the calming of rocking.
Now allow the rocking to come into a little bit smaller orbits. Like a pendulum coming into stillness. And if it feels easeful for you, you can keep the rocking going throughout the whole time we're together. Just very subtle. And if it feels easeful for you to allow your eyes to close if they haven't already. And if not, just feel welcome to allow them to stay open. And maybe gazing down at the table or at the floor. And if it feels comfortable to allow your hands to stay on your heart and on your belly, keep them there. And if not, allow them to find a place that does feel easeful and natural and comfortable for you. And if at any point in these next minutes of meditating, it feels difficult to stay steady sitting, please just very quietly stand up. Or if you like, to just quietly walk in the back of your room. What we're wanting to do is to feel ease and comfort and not to force or push or pressurize. And so if there's an ability to connect with your breath, just notice how you notice that you're breathing. Do you feel your chest expand, your belly expand? Do you notice the coolness of the in-breath and the warmth of the out-breath? Do you notice sensations at the nostrils or in the throat? So just be curious how you know that you're breathing without in any way needing to change the breath, force the breath. Just lovingly receive the breath. just exactly as it is. And even though there may be thoughts or moods or emotions or that come up, there might be sounds that pull your attention away. Just notice and very lovingly connect with the breath.
If you sense that your breath is deepening, allow your attention to deepen with it. To feel the whole body breathing. A very gentle uplift with each in-breath and the calming and the relaxing, the letting go with each out-breath. It extends throughout your chest and your back, your arms and your legs, into your neck and your face. So certainly it's not the anatomical breath that's breathing in your whole body. It's the energetic breath and the impact of the breath you can feel in your whole body. Not something that you can trust. You can trust the air to fill up your whole body. And give you a little bit more energy on the in-breath. And you can trust your body can expel the air on the out-breath, allowing you to rest, relax, and let go a little bit more with each out-breath. Present and attentive, alert, and yet settled, calm, resting with each in and out breath.
Allowing your mind to be open and loving and non-judgmental about whatever shows up. There's no need to control your breath, control your thoughts, control your feelings. Just notice what shows up and reconnect with the breathing in and breathing out. Remembering if the rocking is supportive, if the hands on the heart and the belly are the support, use them, allow them, don't hinder them. Maybe that the breath has settled even a little bit more and you can allow the breath to support you to allow your whole body to calm, to settle. It isn't an efforting, it's a relaxing into the breath, relaxing into the out breath.
So soon I'm going to ring the bell. The invitation is to listen to the sound of the bell until you cannot hear it anymore. And then very slowly, move your fingers and toes and open your eyes and have a stretch. So I'm interested to know the impact of that meditation, if you care to share a few words. I cried the whole time. It's beautiful. Relaxing and opening. Anger and self judgment coming up. Deep and comforting. Challenging neighbors, soothing, calming. Yes, so here we are. I'm sorry, one of you is not feeling safe right now. Mm. Part of the reason why I wanted to offer this meditation was to support finding safety. And when that's available and that helps, it's very good. And if that's not helpful, then you need to trust what's going to help you. And that might mean that you need to be off the Zoom and go to a place where you do feel safe right now. The most important thing is that you trust yourself and that you do what you feel you need. That's important. So I want to begin with a little bit of a sharing about me and my life story and then go into some of the details of what I wanted to talk about tonight. Um, I, I've been
Then I was in 20 Ajahn. It's it's a very um, uh, traditional monastic form. Ajahn Chah is a great forest meditation master. And we had just all kinds of meditation. So we had meditation vigils every two weeks. Uh, let me see if I can close some of the other things that are on my browser so that you get more of me and it's less diluted. How's that? Is that better? Yeah, okay, great. We had three month retreats every winter time. We had a month of solitary retreat every summer time. We had 10 day retreats a few times a year, and this was every year for 20 years. And when we had teachers, they were remarkable teachers, incredibly wise teachers. So being a monastic, one of the privileges of being a monastic is, is that it's an immersive situation in the Dhamma. He's just completely saturated in it. And yet, even after all of that, meditation, I discovered that there were still some components of unworthiness and fear that I couldn't shake, even with very, very deep insight, profound insight, liberating insight. So at some point, I started being interested in the journey of trauma. And then about 15 years ago, I started to be interested in the journey of, of a particular kind of trauma called attachment trauma or developmental trauma. And this journey has made all the difference in the world. Because in some situations, as it was in mine, even when there's very profound and liberating insights, it doesn't clear the trauma out of our system. It doesn't do exactly what we need in order for those things to release. So I became curious about different kinds of trauma and I became curious about different things that support releasing those traumas. And I wanna give a little bit of an overview of what trauma is and different kinds of trauma and then talk about a trauma-informed way of approaching the Satipatthana Sutta or the Four Foundations of Mindfulness and why that's important. So, um, Basil van der Kolk defines trauma as a lasting impact on the individual's physiology, mind, and emotions as a result of experiencing or witnessing event that overwhelms the capacity to cope. This can lead to a range of symptoms and challenges in daily life. There's a whole bunch of different kinds of traumas. And the reason why it's helpful is, is that it's not always obvious and as we become more familiar with them, then it can help us understand some of the things that we're dealing with. Developmental trauma is the impact of adverse childhood events, chronic lack of safety, lack of protection, lack of being soothed, of being seen, of being attuned to, of being encouraged, and not having a safe haven to return to having guardians harm or rupture trust and not repair them. This is significant because when we have this, it means that we become extra alert to signals of danger and we miss neutral and positive feelings. It means that it looks like we're li we are calm, but actually we're anxious. 
And it also means that we cannot feel and interpret correctly what is going on. And this means that it's really difficult for us to regulate ourselves. And it means also that it's really difficult for us to use the meditation tools for the purposes that they were designed for. The second kind of trauma is situational trauma, and that's often the ones that we're the most familiar with. This is what happens with accidents or domestic violence or sexual assault or the impact of war or hate crimes or disasters or chronic emotional or financial deprivation, medical procedures, or somehow being forced to move. And again, it's not just that the event happens, but there's some kind of an impact that isn't metabolized and it stays lodged in our physiology, in our nervous system. Epigenemic trauma is the stuff that's carried through generations. We see this with people who've experienced persecution or genocide. We see this with people of color. We see this with Jewish people. We see this with indigenous people. It's transmitted from one generation to another. Vicarious trauma or compassion fatigue is a PTSD related symptom that you receive vicariously as a secondary target to trauma. First responders on the scene, people or groups who have direct trauma, Compassion fatigue is experienced by those who are in helping professions, doctors, psychotherapists, shoko workers, firefighters, empaths walking around the world. It's not the same as burnout. It's that our systems start to feel fear, that memories just don't go away. The brain and the body start to change. Sometimes vicarious trauma can happen when we hear news of another kind of trauma. It impacts us so deeply that we are lit up. And then there is compound trauma, which is when we have two or more of these types of traumas. So, for myself, it was eye-opening to recognize how many of these different kinds of traumas that I had. It was sobering. And I want to emphasize that part of what trauma-informed approach means is, is that we emphasize safety we emphasize the emotional and physical safety of individuals and the Sangha. We emphasize trustworthiness, that individual care needs must be addressed in a way that supports trustworthiness. We emphasize choice. We emphasize collaboration. And we emphasize empowerment. So part of the reason why this is all important is that any of us who are dealing with unmetabolized trauma carry a heightened sense of vulnerability. And as we understand trauma-informed practices, meditation and meditation communities become a safer place where individuals can regain a sense of safety in their bodies trust that they can make choices that are life affirming and that people are trustworthy and can support them in making healthy choices. As sanghas and meditation approaches are trauma informed, it minimizes re-traumatizing. And so what can happen inadvertently is that standard meditation practices and the classical meditation instructions sometimes activate trauma, re-trigger trauma, 
And so a trauma-informed approach emphasizes choice, emphasizes consent, and emphasizes staying within your window of tolerance so that you're not pushing yourself in ways that will likely cause you to be triggered. And then of course, any of us who are dealing with unmetabolized trauma, when we are in an environment that recognizes this and normalizes that, it creates a context where our own um, self-judgment or self-blame or anxiety can soften because we're in an environment that just understands and recognizes the prevalence of that. So when all of these things are present, a trauma-informed approach makes meditation accessible because individuals can be present, hear the teachings, and because they address the obstacles that keep them from understanding liberating practices. So I am bringing an introduction to the Satipatthana Sutta because the Satipatthana Sutta, which in English is called the Four Foundations of Mindfulness, and you might hear me use these words interchangeably, is one of the most significant of all of the suttas in the Theravadan Buddhist tradition. It's the basis of secular mindfulness. And of all of the traditions, it's one of the ones that is regarded the, the highest. And part of the reason why that's so is because it contains an entire set of instructions about how to bring balance into our body, into our feelings, into our mind states, into how to practice in daily life relationships. And it shows us a way to free ourselves from different kinds of suffering that keep us confused and tangled up in cycles of greed or of aversion and hatred and of not seeing things clearly. And so the basic promise of this meditation is that it promises liberation. So I want to go through some of the foundations of this meditation and then talk about ways that we can make it trauma-informed. So the first foundation is foundation of the body. And as we did in our meditation practice, we are trying to create a safe space and offering techniques and ways to focus that keep us grounded. And what we're interested in doing is encouraging a gentle and gradual exploration of the body sensations. So part of the reason why it's helpful to bring a trauma-informed perspective to this set of teachings is that there's some things that have premises that if we have unmetabolized trauma in our system, that are, may not be true or likely are not true. So the first instruction is you go to the forest or to the root of the tree or to an empty hut and you sit down, having fold their legs crosswise, they set the body erect and establish mindfulness in front of them. Ever mindful, they breathe in and ever mindful, they breathe out. So I've changed the pronouns in omitted monks because that's sometimes hard to wrap our mind around to think that this is actually for us when it uses a word that none of us are. But when we have unmetabolized trauma in our system, it's actually not so easy to feel safe enough to go into the forest or the root of the tree or sit in an empty hut or to close one's eyes and to feel mindfulness in front of one. So the very first instruction may not be something that's available.
And so what we need is to give permission in case we don't have that safety and to give permission to establish that safety as a first priority. This mindfulness of the body has six different meditations in it. The breath meditation, which we started briefly, being able to focus on the different postures of the body and daily life activities of walking and dressing and eating, tasting, and all of the daily life activities of being human, including cleaning ourselves and going to the toilet and showering. The next one is around the 32 parts of the body. And this one is tricky. And it's tricky because of a number of reasons. One of the reasons why is because sometimes the 32 parts of the body meditation is not about understanding the nature of our own body, but about understanding the nature of somebody else's body. So the instructions are to use this practice to understand the nature of our own body. And when we do that, if we have a lot of shame or if there's a lot of fear in our body, then the instructions to look at it in terms of it in its impurity may be activating. So what can also be helpful is instead of looking at it in terms of its impure elements, the same instruction includes looking at the body for just exactly as it is. Just noticing what's here. What are the arms like? What is the liver like? What are the lungs like? What is it all like? And so rather than having a judgment connected to it, just look at it in terms of what does having a body mean? in terms of what is it composed of. One of the adaptations I have used is to combine loving kindness meditation with the 32 parts meditation so that we bring an active caring to our body as a way to soften the, the fear or the self-hatred or the activation that can sometimes happen for a whole variety of reasons. The point of this practice, the 32 parts of the body meditation is often used as a way to give perspective around lust. And in this case, I think that there's a, a value in seeing that not everyone is driven by visual perception. Some people's experience of sexual desire comes from different ways, like from closeness or emotional intimacy or connection. And so I would say that this 32 parts of the body meditation as an antidote for sexual desire is gender based, that it's not often, it doesn't seem that it plays out in the same way between different genders, how this all operates. So that because the meditation is interested in giving us some perspective and leverage around lust, and if our sexual desire is not activated visually, then what we can do is we can use the the basis of this as a way of bringing how our sexual desire does get activated if that is something that takes us out of our capacity to be present and brings us into a situation where we're out of control. The first foundation of mindfulness has also the elements. And then the last one is corpse meditation, which is really looking at the way a body dissolves in order that we can see that there isn't anything solid here and that our bodies are like anybody else's bodies in that they have the nature to die. 
The second foundation of mindfulness is the mindfulness of feeling tones. And this is different from feelings as we normally use the word in English. This is the, the feelings related to pleasant, unpleasant, and neutral. And one of the really important parts of this foundation is that it begins to invite us to look at something without so much identifying it as being me that is experiencing it or mine, but just something that is arising. But where we need to get a little bit more sensitive is, is that when we are dealing with unmetabolized trauma, what is not present in the sutta in any way is the understanding about the spectrum of feelings being within our window of tolerance or outside our window of tolerance. This encourage us to stay with pleasant, unpleasant, and neutral sensations and see the pleasant, unpleasant, and neutral component of anything that we're experiencing, whether we're seeing it, or we're feeling it, or we're thinking it, or we're tasting it, or we're smelling it. But it doesn't allow us to discern whether the painful component of it, the unpleasantness of it, is outside of our window of tolerance to manage. So what is needed in a trauma-informed perspective is to understand window of tolerance, to understand the physiological signs of being in our window of tolerance and the physiological signs of being out of our window of tolerance, and to prioritize that when we are getting close to being outside of our window of tolerance, or when we are outside of our window of tolerance, the only thing that is important for us to do is to come back into our window of tolerance. That's it, to come back into a place where we're able to manage what's actually happening for us. And the meditation instructions do not give us the parameters that help us differentiate between painful experiences that we can manage and painful experiences that we cannot manage. And as a result of that, it doesn't give us the support to know that one of the ways that we can support ourselves staying in our window of tolerance is by moving back and forth between unpleasant sensation and pleasant sensation. Or that we can shift our frame of reference from the second foundation where we're dealing pleasant, unpleasant, and neutral and come back to our body experience. Or we can move outside of looking at pleasant, unpleasant, and neutral, and do things like we did at the beginning of our guided meditation, humming or rocking. Or for me, nature has been an enormous support. And when I was approaching my window of tolerance or outside of my window of tolerance, I would go to big trees or ancient rocks or the ocean or magic gardens. And I would feel the support of that holding as a way to help me navigate coming back into my window of tolerance and navigating the activation that I was dealing with. So there's a whole bunch of practices that we can learn, visualizations that we can learn that support us coming into our window of tolerance. And that becomes something that is important as we are moving into any body of instructions to know that when we get activated, when we get triggered, what we need is to settle and to calm and to soothe and to support ourselves as the first priority. So it's not very often that a meditation teacher will say, 
these are the meditation instructions. And I want you not to listen to me and to trust yourself when you are in a position where what's happening for you is more than you can manage. And yet that's exactly what is needed. So the third foundation of mindfulness is the mindfulness of mind or chitta. And this is being able to notice the thoughts, the moods, the emotions, the, the feelings as we ordinarily know it. And again, we need to be careful because the sutta instruction doesn't help us differentiate between mind objects that are within our window of tolerance and mind objects that are outside of our window of tolerance. And that is something that becomes imperative for us to be able to discern. One of the things that is a common trait of any of us who are dealing with unmetabolized trauma is that either we tend towards hypervigilance or we tend towards hypovigilance, where we are frozen or numb. When we have attachment wounding or attachment trauma, one of the characteristics is, is that we live in a faux window of tolerance where we think we're doing okay, but actually we're not. We don't actually even have a way of knowing how much stress we're dealing with. So one of the incredible liberating features of the third foundation of mindfulness is the instruction to observe what's going on without identifying with it, without attaching to it. If we have anger, if we have loving kindness, if we have compassion, if we have thoughts of cruelty, we can just know them for what they are. And there's a way in which this is hugely liberating. But one of the challenges is that there's a difference between non-attachment and disassociation. And this sutta doesn't give us the language that helps us understand the difference between the non-attachment that is healthy and the disassociation, which is a sign of us being outside of our window of tolerance. So a trauma-informed practice, again, would emphasize understanding the signs of being inside and outside the window of tolerance understanding the signs of being dissociated, being indifferent, being neutral and being equanimous, recognizing that the more we get towards the edge of our window of tolerance and outside of it, there's an inverse proportion relationship between our capacity to observe what's going on we start reacting and the reactions are much more in the fight, flight, freeze, fawn, or fornicate categories. They're trauma responses. And many of us have heard the first three, fight, flight, and freeze, but fawn or trying to please others and fornicate sexual activity can also sometimes be a trauma response, a strategy or a way to compensate or just the simple biological discharge out of trauma. And so we don't have discernment in the sutta about what kind of anger is ordinary anger and what kind of anger is trauma response anger because they need different things.
So we want to use mindfulness to begin to identify our triggers and reactions in a non-judgmental way and recognize that the first thing that gets offline when we are triggered is our, is our accurate capacity to observe. And that what we need is to come back into a window of tolerance to be able to recognize the thoughts, emotions, and moods and feelings that we have. The fourth foundation of mindfulness is the mindfulness of dhammas or phenomena. And what this does is helps us see the impact of trauma on our perceptions and beliefs. And one of the reasons why I am so passionate about attachment repair is because when we come into the world without having had some basic needs met reliably enough, it skews our sense of who we are. It shapes the relationships that we have, the way we view ourselves, the way we view the world, and it impacts our health. And it is unusual, it is uncommon, that even when we have been a dedicated meditator for years, and even when we've had really profound insights, that those insights shift those attachment patterning. And so we can think that there's something wrong with us or that we're not a good meditator or that there's something wrong with the meditation. But really what's happening is, is that we haven't used the right fulcrum and leverage with the things that are going on with us in order to have effect change. This set of meditation instructions is not the optimal thing for attachment repair. And that's not something that's often shared. So in the tradition that I came from, for the first 20 years or so of living in the monastery, well, I've been meditating for over 40 years. So probably the first 30 years of meditation, the message was is, is that all you needed was meditation. And that if it wasn't working, you just needed to do more of it or needed to do it better and that it would fix anything that was needing to be fixed, it would fix it. And my life experience has shown me differently. <laughs> and I'm quite happy to be bearing a flag to say the meditation is awesome and it's not the only thing <laughs> that we need. <laughs> So this fourth foundation of mindfulness has many different components to it of looking at our experiences in terms of the hindrances of the aggregates of the sense bases of the factors of awakening of the four noble truths. And all of this helps us to be able to discern moving in a direction where there's less suffering, moving in a direction where there's more ease, there's more joy, there's more peace, there's more equanimity. And so the Buddha ends this whole series of amazing set of teachings saying, if anyone should develop these four foundations of mindfulness in such a way for seven years, one of two fruits could be expected, either complete liberation, or if there's a trace of clinging left, the one step beneath complete liberation, which is called non-returner, then goes on and says seven years, six years, five years, four years, three years, two years, one years, and then six months, five months, you know, it's very systematic. If you just do this for seven days, you can expect one of two results, either that you're completely liberated or you're liberated with only just the tiniest trace of clinging remains. So many of us have been meditating for more than seven days. <laughs> I've been meditating for decades. 
And when I understand the interplay between the levels of trauma I was carrying, that these meditation instructions was not helping me to understand or resolve, it gave me more perspective on why the insights that I had were not something that was releasing some of my core views and the basic sense of fear that I had in my system. So I want to pause here and invite comments, impact, questions. It's a bit of a mouthful. How are you doing? So it might be easier if you raise an electronic hand because there's a number of people who don't have their videos on. And then we can call on you, ask you to unmute. Yes, Adrian. Um, yeah, I think it was just really helpful to hear that meditation isn't the only thing. <laughs> um, I've been uh, meditating for about about seven years, and um, and it's given me a lot. Um, and, and I don't know, it was, it's just helpful um, to know what I might have to do to adjust. Thank you for sharing. So in two weeks time, I'm gonna be doing another Zoom for or a hybrid, hopefully hybrid, and I'll be there in person um, with um, the San Francisco Dharma Collective which is gonna be an overview on the integrated meditation program and why it might be helpful. Because this is an innovative program that I have developed that's taken the trauma, the attachment repair um, technology that I used out of a psychotherapeutic context and it's turning it into something that can be used for meditators with the support of the co-founder and I'm excited by it because I know I am not the only one <laughs> I'm pretty confident I'm not the only one that's dealing with this stuff <laughs> yeah. any other comments or questions or things you'd like to share Uh, Jenny. Um, thank you. Thank you for sharing this, especially the perspective of having been in with Ajahn Cha for so, so long and, and suffered that. Um, I believe I've heard other people, um, usually women who are in similar situations who also found their way out at some point that they realized it wasn't serving them. Um, in terms of, so far you've helped us recognize that this can happen and mentioned that we should become students of our own physiology in order to understand when we're out of the window of tolerance, but you haven't yet mentioned any other way to cultivate that, have you? Or have I missed it? Um, I have worked with a trauma therapist since 2014 and that has been invaluable because, you know, she's she was amazing. And after knowing her for the first, I don't know, maybe the second session, you know, she knew I, I was a nun. You know, I'm a professional meditator. I'm a meditation teacher. And she was, she was very respectful, you know, in terms of recognizing the skills that I had. But she said, even for you, the first thing that goes offline is your capacity to keep yourself in your own window of tolerance, which is one of the things that's needed in order to optimally release trauma. And that's one of the main things that a trauma therapist's job is, is to keep you in this 
magic zone where you are activated, but still in your window of tolerance that helps you release in a way that is the safest way to do it without re-traumatizing yourself. Mm -hmm. So I have worked with her and I've also, you know, done stuff on my own. So I, I don't think it's wise to try and do this without support. Mm -hmm. And then it becomes an issue of who gets to have the support or the people who have the money to pour, pay for it. But whatever way you can, it's, it's, a, it's like, it's, a, it's extremely important. Yeah. And the integrated meditation program weaves in some trauma informed practices or? So the integrated meditation program is designed to help us shift our core beliefs and our schema and our um, uh, experiences in close relationships. And I and another person who understands the technology will be working with you one-on-one. -on -one. So this is going to be part of the reason why it's innovative is that the psychotherapeutic model is based on a one-on-one -on -one relationship with the therapist as the main support. And I want to turn this into a Sangha activity where there's one-on-one -on -one support with teachers, one-on-one -on -one, and support with, with the big group, support with the small group, and support with peers, that peers learn how to support each other to do this safely. And there is no model of this has not happened yet in this particular technology. Yeah. Beautiful. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, Ray. Hi. Um, this is a meditation question. If, if this doesn't feel like the right space for it, just tell me so. Um, but that's what was on my mind. Well, it's part of what was on my mind when I was listening to talk is like, uh, I think that sometimes when I meditate, I feel like I'm physically like trapped in my body almost. And like, I kind of can't move. And there's this binary, I feel like of, you know, like, you're supposed to kind of sit through this because every time you don't, you condition yourself to keep running away from it. But then, you know, sometimes I just can't. And so, uh, I'm so having right. trouble understanding what the other options are, I guess. Okay. So that's the premise that most meditation instructions come with that if you don't sit with it, you're just running away from it and that it's not gonna actually resolve, okay? If, if that, it's, I don't have enough information to, to know exactly what's going on for you. So I can't actually give you um, comprehensive advice, but let's just say that it might be that that's a component of a freeze response, okay? If that's a freeze response, what's the most helpful is to not allow yourself to stay in that. And that means that you can do whatever you need to do to not stay in that, whatever that means, okay? If that isn't a freeze response and it is in fact just a development of your meditation practice, then there is some value in staying with it. But the difference between one and the other is, is that one is something that is outside of your window of tolerance and the other is inside your window of tolerance. And it takes having the discernment to know the difference between those two to be able to figure that out. Because if you are outside of your window of tolerance, it's not kind, it's not skillful, it's not helpful. It's not that you're running away from it. You are, it's, you are doing what you need to do in order to be safe. It's a completely different interpretation of what's happening. And the more teachers are more trauma informed, but it's a long ways from where it could be or might be. 
And all I can say, Ray, is, is that I can't tell you the number of people who've come to me after retreats, having had experiences where they were outside of the window of tolerance. And the meditation taught teachers told them virtually the same thing. You have to stay with it. If you don't stay with it, you're just running away and you're not going to get the energy or the support or the mental stamina to, to go through it. And it, it was a mop up for me to help them understand that that actually wasn't a helpful thing for the teacher to say. Yeah, thank you. Um, I think something that occurred to me too while you were talking is that, you know, I don't know what the quote unquote right answer is for me or for anyone, but that there can be more than two options in that scenario. I don't necessarily have to stick with it or leave that like maybe there's other options for taking care of myself while staying in a seated posture or or something like that. So I think uh, it also just widened my understanding of uh, the spectrum of playful options I can have to stay in tune with myself. Yes. And what I would encourage you to do in addition to opening up the binary is to be more discerning about what is inside and outside of your window of tolerance. Because really when you're outside of your window of tolerance, it's the most skillful thing is to do whatever you need to do in order to get back in it. And that means get up or move around or go talk to a tree or put your hands in fur or whatever it is, you know? So that, so that I would encourage you to, be, to get clear about for yourself, what are the physiological indications of being inside your window of tolerance and outside of your window of tolerance? And what does that experience that you have of being locked into your body, how does that measure? Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, Ron. Hi. Hi. Um, does I, I want to ask, does Adrian still have a, a question? Her hand is still up and, because what I have isn't important. I, I want to voice some um, appreciation, but I, I, if she's got something, I'd, I'd like to let her speak. Yes. I'm wondering if her hand is still up or, or if that's an accident. Okay. Well, oh, no, I'll... it's not a, it's not an accident. I put it back up because I had a, I had another question, um, but I can go up like. You're, you're good. We have them. <laughs> go next. Okay. Okay. Um, okay. Um, so I was just wondering if you had suggestions for being in a situation where you you can't you're kind of confined um to not be able to like achieve that safety um uh, if there's sort of if there's sort of kind of opportunities to sort of take it where you can in a situation that's adverse and and difficult to you know circumstantially to to have safety so Adrian, that's a really, really important question and it's complex because it's not easy to hypothetically answer it. Yeah. And one of the things about any of us with who are metabolizing trauma is, is that these kinds of questions come up for us a lot. And it's part of our healing journey is to learn increasing ways of how to advocate and look for and ask for and find safety and it's not a magic wand where as soon as we do this then all of a sudden the adverse circumstances disappear but what's necessary is to recognize that the safety is needed that you are worthy of it and that there are plenty of times when we can't actually do it by ourselves and that might take different shapes with different scenarios yeah thank you so Ron, as much as I appreciate your comments, I think we need to close because we need to have a couple of announcements 
before we finish. And then if anyone wants to stay on for a few minutes afterwards, I'd be happy to stay on. <laughs>